Walking on campus at Michigan State, you will run across a residence hall called the Liberty High Bailey Hall. With signage identifying the structure, this is the dorm for the Bailey Scholars Program and the Residential Initiative for the Study of the Environment. Next door is the Bailey Greenhouse, an urban farm, growing organic and healthy produce for consumption on campus. A short walk away, you can find the Eustace Cole Hall, the first horticultural laboratory building in the country, designed by Bailey and built in 1888. Who is this man named Liberty Hyde Bailey? In the gardens nearby is a statue of Liberty Hyde Bailey. Why is there a statue of him on campus here at Michigan State? A residence hall and a greenhouse and a famous building he designed. A student from 1877, a professor here from 1885 to 1889, what did he do to earn such honor and reverence? How did he become such a significant person on campus? And what made him a globally famous horticulturist and the father of modern horticulture? The plaque at the statue reads, a native of South Haven, Michigan. Let's take a trip back in time and westward in Michigan, west from Lansing to the crystal blue waters of Lake Michigan. Travel inland at South Haven's iconic lighthouse past the 1850s bustling Black River Harbor front to an old farmhouse and small forest about a mile inland. This is the birthplace of Liberty High Bailey Jr. The house was built in 1855 by his father, Bailey Sr. Bailey Sr. and his wife, Sarah, moved to South Haven in 1856 from Bangor, two years before our Bailey Jr. was born in 1858 in this Greek Revival country home. Bailey Jr. was the third son for the Baileys. Bailey's birth home and homestead is now known as the Bailey Museum and Gardens. It is a National Historic Landmark and a Michigan Historic Site. For many years, the Bailey Homestead and Orchards were very prolific, highly awarded with formal accolades for their fruit production for sale, and they grew everything they needed and more. Grains, cattle, sheep, chickens, and of course, their famous apples and peaches. After many years and several owners and property sales, in 1938, the remaining parcel of the Birth Homestead and acreage was purchased by a foresighted benefactor. The home was donated to the city of South Haven in 1938 by Mrs. Clifton Charles while Bailey was still living in New York. Her late husband, Clifton Charles, had been a great friend and roommate of young Bailey at college, and Mrs. Charles gifted the home and land and required that the house be preserved to honor Liberty Hyde Bailey, who by 1938 was world-renowned for his work in horticulture, the contributions globally, and was very famous revered and had earned the respected title of the father of modern horticulture. On September 4, 1938, a formal dedication ceremony was held on the West Porch. Bailey was unable to attend the ceremony, although he did send a telegraph stating, I trust the gift will freshen old memories, yield satisfaction to the people, and stimulate youth. Bailey was an early student of the outdoors. He advocated youth education, and the museum continues his legacy with its Bailey Budding Naturalist Summer Program. Bailey is also credited with creating the 4-H Youth Program, still in practice across the country today. The house was used as a rental hostel, then a nurse's dormitory. In the 1950s, a group of concerned and committed citizens with the mayor formed the Liberty Hyde Bailey Park Museum. In 2019, the Board of Trustees modified the name to the Liberty Hyde Bailey Museum and Gardens to incorporate the remaining two acres of the primordial forest and the maintained gardens, preserving Bailey's love of nature and his philosophy, all embodied in his famous book, The Holy Earth, published in 1915. Let's return to Liberty Hyde Bailey for the moment and explore how this place that he was born into 
1858 South Haven, shaped and molded him to become the outstanding person that he grew into and continued to be to the age of 96. It is a truly remarkable and wonderful story. Let's explore and go inside. Early in young Bailey's career, he said that he planned to divide his life into three parts. I will dedicate 25 years of preparation, his learning phase. I will spend 25 years earning a livelihood, his labor phase. And I will spend 25 years using my abilities to do as I choose, his leisure phase. In the museum, the exhibits reflect these periods of his life. Let's start and take a look at Growing Up Bailey, reflecting his early and formative years here on the South Haven frontier in the front room of the museum. As mentioned earlier, Bailey was born here in South Haven on March 15, 1858. At that time, the house was smaller than it is today, and this is the room where he was born, and the cradle that he slept in as an infant. There are poems written by his mother Sarah displayed on the wall. His mother was not well educated, however she learned the educational, emotional, and spiritual value of poetry and wrote many poems in the home. She read many of these to young Bailey while he was too young to understand, however it did form a basis of their bonding. Bailey's first experiences in the outside garden were also with his mother. This was the beginning of his lifelong bonding with nature and his continuing quest for knowledge and understanding of the natural world. At the tender age of four, Bailey's mother became ill and passed away in this same room that Bailey was born in. This had a significant impact on Bailey's development as a very young child. If we go to the next room and look at the family apple tree of influence, we see a quick summary of influencers on young Bailey. Obviously, his birth mother, Sarah, as just discussed. Also, his father, who was a very devout, conservative, and religious man. He was deemed by his peers to be righteous, steadfast, direct, and religious. He was an initial mason in the founding of the Star of the Lake Masonic Temple here in South Haven. After Bailey's mother died, his father married Martha Bridges, who became Bailey's stepmother. One significant realization by his new mother was that Bailey was very smart and inquisitive. She became his chief advocate for learning, exploring, asking questions, and learning to read. This intuition gave her the courage to continue her advocacy about the potential she saw in Bailey and his need for higher education. Bailey's teacher at grade school was Ms. Julia Field. She realized what a smart and precocious student she had. Early on in his schooling, his father allowed Bailey to read Charles Darwin's book on the evolution of species. And he was challenged by the Latin names and asked Ms. Field if she would teach him Latin. The driver for this request was that all scientific plant names were in Latin and Bailey had no idea what to make of the words. And this was used by Bailey around the world for the next 80 years. There are other significant contributors to young Bailey's upbringing and education in South Haven. One very valuable group is referenced in two displays in this room. The diorama in the center showcase depicts a natural blue clean river that ran through the Bailey property. In the spring and fall each year, the Potawatomi Native Americans would set up their encampments on the far edge of the Bailey property. They befriended Bailey, and from them he learned respect for the land, water, and wildlife. Imagine for a moment the gleeful enjoyment of young lads from two different cultures running through the backwoods to the stream, catching fish, and more. Let's go out to the backwoods. Bailey referred to them as the backgrounds, and earlier the primordial forest. There remain about two acres of backwoods from the original Bailey farm at the museum. There is a wonderful pathway through the woods with many points of interest, including sculptures, mobiles, memorial benches, birdhouses, and a novel stumpery garden. There are also many natural plants. This is a wonderful place to walk into nature right near downtown South Haven. One feature in the backwoods 
is the stainless and red mobile that reflects Bailey's abilities and history to challenge the status quo as an independent thinker, one that challenged existing beliefs about plants, nature, and horticulture. The large red piece characterizes Bailey, and he circles around the others, reflecting his independence and free thought. Between the backwoods and the museum is the blacksmith shop. It was donated to the museum in 1997. It is period authentic and was a working blacksmith and carriage shop for a large number of years in South Haven. It is currently used for various educational museum events, including the Bailey Buddy Naturalist Program, art and craft events, nature talks, and by the squirrels in the winter. After Bailey retired from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York in 1914, he reserved the last 25 years of his plan to use his skills to do what he chooses, leisure. Some of this is reflected on the walls of the McNeil Room, our flexible learning facility. In 1917, at the age of 59, he sailed to China with his wife Annette and daughter Zoe. This Indiana Jones of horticulture then sailed a thousand miles up the Yangtze River collecting specimens and remarked how many new species he had cataloged on that trip. In between his travels during 40 years of leisure, he was recruited by President Teddy Roosevelt to help address many challenges the country was experiencing. The country's urban-rural challenges, he championed the establishment of the university extension programs, such as MSU Extension, across multiple state land-grant colleges. He championed the electrification of rural farm communities, advocated to create the rural postal service so that the agricultural community was connected to the rest of the country, and was a strong advocate for women's opportunities based on merit, not gender, including many in the academic world. Some have said that Bailey was a Renaissance man before his time. The more you learn about Dr. Bailey, you may also believe that he was a Renaissance man. However, we believe that he was the right man who lived at the right time. His teachings, writings, philosophy, and legacy are more relevant today given the earth and society's current challenges than they were nearly 70 years ago when he died. A global traveler for 40 years, travels to collect, catalog, and document plant species across the globe in the third part of his life. This Indiana Jones did not let age slow him down, and he was able to continue his travels almost to his very end. In December 1949, at the age of 91, he slipped and fell in a New York bank, breaking his leg. In his pocket, he already had one-way tickets to Africa. He never recovered to make the trip. A student of life, global horticulturist, educator, philosopher, poet, photographer, artist, social change pioneer and advocate, explorer, environmentalist, or as he was called on his 90th birthday event at Cornell, a humanist, and the least known native son of South Haven. As George Lawrence wrote in 1955, he was charitable to his fellow man to a fault, and even in his last years, he was understanding of his professional critics. He looked for good in the world. He lived a good life. Bailey died on Christmas Day, 1954. One of Bailey's most impactful statements was presented on the occasion of his 90th birthday. It is a marvelous planet on which we ride. It is a great privilege to live there on, to partake in the journey, and to experience its goodness. We may cooperate rather than rebel. We should try to find the meanings rather than to be satisfied only with the spectacles. My life has been a continuous fulfillment of dreams.